here with uh, Marko Kazic, who is the founder of Zamfir, and uh, he is now going to talk to us about School 2 and uh, how to enable the universal education for the bottom 7 billion. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. So w when I wrote down School 2.0 for the first time, it was, it sounded a bit pompous, School 2.0, but if you think about large audiences and asking people, how do you feel about your education? Are you satisfied with the education that you've got? Most of the people will say, well, no, or I don't want to say, but no. It's, it's, mostly, it's mostly one of these two things. And because we transgressed so many things and we've transcended um, in, in medicine, in technology and infrastructure, we still have this one part of our society which is kind of stuck in the 18th century because we are not really sure how to change it, what to do with it. Um, education is something that's really spanning throughout our, our whole societies and it's really hard to change because we like iterative changes, we like to play it safe, we like to play it step by step. So the school 2.0 should essentially be something that's really written from scratch. And I, I know that developers prefer to write things from scratch, so I think this is going to be fun. But the first, of, first of all, I want to say something about Education 1.0. So this is the thing that we have right now. Education 1.0 is the school that you went to, the school that I went to. And I'm from Serbia, but I'm guessing that it's, it's pretty much common in the whole Europe that we kind of have the same educational system. Um, so elementary school, high school, college, maybe some kind of vocational school, but that's it. We've kind of progressed through that and we've been given a cu curriculum and you kind of assume that this is the, the, the span of the things that you need to know. You go to a school, you get something, it's re either in a book or it's something that you hear from your professors and that's like, that's all of the things that you need to learn in life, right? I mean, it doesn't make really, it doesn't make a lot of sense. When you think about where we learn, most of our learning comes from other people, talking to other people, experiences, what we do with our lives. Every day you come outside, you know, you go to, a, to you know, a store, you run into someone on the street, that's where you learn. So most of our learning is actually non-institutional. Isaac Asimov had this really nice, um, nice thing to say about self-education. He said that that's the only education that he believes exists. And I completely concur with him because when you look at how much have you learned in school and how much have you learned, you know, at home, with your friends, with your family, with strangers on the street, it's our, our educational systems are grossly incompetent to actually provide us with education that's actually valuable to us in real life. That's why when you go to a grocery store, the person behind the counter doesn't really use the skills that they acquired in school. Interpersonal skills, you know, being polite to people. How do you grow your own food? How do you distribute that food to people? That's, that's one of the things that you never learn in school, right? So if we think about self-education, we think about I'm going to take something and learn it or I'm going to learn something because something or someone has forced me to do or to learn. Um, you know, you have a situation, you just have to acquire knowledge to, to do some action. So, but when you say I'm a self-educated person, that's a big no-no. You can't say that because then you're an autodidact. What did you do with your life? You didn't go to school. You don't have a degree. Are you even human? What's happening? So you kind of get isolated from the society, even though you, know, you, you really know a lot of things, but you simply don't have a piece of paper to prove that. But when you go to apply for a job, you come with your diploma and they say, okay, we don't need that, let's just talk. And you think to yourself, well, is, is this a scam or is this like a hidden camera or something? What's happening? So we kind of have this whole um, academia built which has its own values that we kind of always, you know, project on other people, but we never choose to follow them. These are the rules for everyone else, but for us. 
And it kind of applies more to people who kind of graduated because you, know, you, you have a self-preservational instinct. You, you need to protect yourself. You graduated college. So why the hell did you go to college five years when your employer doesn't really want to look at your degree? So people want skill. And when you look at the whole educational system that we go through, we have a few issues with that. Well, a few issues would be an understatement. There's probably somewhere around a wiki page that has hundreds of these written out. But these are like five most, most, really, most important. One is the social dynamic is wrong. Think about this. There is a place, it's concrete. It has a few windows, but you can't exit. There's no way that you can exit until someone who's your authority says you can go out. There are people that you listen, there are social dynamics that you have to follow, there are meals, there are classes. You sit in a room very similar to this one and you can't go out. Is that a school or a prison? <laughs> Like only five minutes is going to take five minutes. Uh, so is that a school or a prison? When you think about that, like, it's mostly what, what people think about is wrong. Like, you don't want to be in a place like that. Yet, we send children to these places. You, you, you're kind of putting them inside a box. Why is that wrong? Because everything that they need to learn about is outside. You don't want them to be inside because the world that you're teaching them about is outside. That's one of the things. You're basically providing isolation as a service. Parents like that because you have jobs. Um, you know, you, you kind of need a couple of hours for yourself. But in the long run, what you're basically doing is saying, this is the world that I want you to, to learn about, but I'm going to place you over here. 10 years, 12 years. Um, it doesn't really encourage you to learn after that. When you graduate school, you know, kids have parties, they throw stuff, they burn stuff. Because, you know, you kinda, you're finished learning, but that's not true. You have to learn all your life. And then, you know, you, you, kinda, you graduate it, and then there's no institution for you to continue learning. So what now? Then you're again left with your uh, self-education, and not a lot of people actually have um, the, the need to actually acquire more knowledge because they were forced to do that in schools in a wrong way. And then again, if you look at academia, that's the only thing that exists. I don't know if you've heard that, but there's nothing in this world except academia. Because when you graduate and you get, get a piece of paper, you're a man or a woman, and then you're accomplished and you can go and do things. But that's not really true, because academia itself is built on a principle of acquiring knowledge throughout your whole life. But no one really wants to pay to learn the whole life, because that's not really productive. So academia is not really what it needs to be, and it's not what it was meant to be when it was conceived. And then you have probably the worst thing for children, that's the cult of the average when a teacher comes into a, a classroom and then they say, um, I'm gonna teach you a certain subject, they have to think about the smartest kid and the kids that don't really catch up that fast. And they have to find an average. So you always need to have an average of a classroom and then you need to start you know, talking to kids in that way. And then you always have a disparity towards you know, both groups, really. Ones that do not catch up and then those who are left behind or they're just lagging, but they can't do more. So school 1.0, really quickly, it's offline first, of course we know that. Knowledge is fragmented. Think about this. We have the internet. We have all the knowledge that we need online. Yet it's like in five billion places all over. And then you have that in schools too, because a teacher would kind of find out something or maybe um, find a way to present a certain subject to kids or, or young people in a more presentable way. But that's like only for one school. Other teachers that teach the same thing don't benefit from that. That's only applied to them. There's no common shared resource. You have public schools, which are predominant here, but then you have private schools. And then if you have a private school in the Western world, usually if you can't afford it, your kid is not going to have good education. 
Uh, I'm sorry for this. Um, so it's not agile. It takes tens of years for governments to change educational curriculums. It doesn't really leverage technology in any way, either in planning that curriculum or you know, really in, in teaching kids because they buy computers and they put it in, in schools, but it's, it's not really used there. It's more like an addition to their curriculums, what they do. And it doesn't really personalize. It doesn't really adapt to people that are learning. All of us here are individuals that have you know, different uh, way of thinking. We have different ways of acquiring knowledge. When you go into a classroom, that vanishes. And then, you know, of course, we had internet, so a lot of smart people thought, we, we can solve this. We have, you know, we have the internet. So we built the internet education, e-education, e-learning, the same way we built PDFs. If you think about PDFs, PDFs are the dumbest thing that exists because you have a book and then you scan it and then you have like the scan of the book, just, you know, digital, doesn't really do anything. And then you have HTML which has hyperlinks and then you can add, you know, rich content, it can be live. A PDF is like, I scanned a book and that it's just there, you can't really do anything with it. So that's the same way we built our education online. We said, uh, okay, we need a classroom, so let's build a portal where people can register, and then there's gonna be one person just talking to them. Video is the worst thing that you can do when you're learning. When you're acquiring knowledge, video is the worst format that you can use because video is for storytelling. We enjoy videos. We, you know, we consume stories over videos. You need a span of information when you're acquiring new knowledge. So if you're sitting somewhere and thinking, well, I have a chance with this professor from the US, and you know, they're talking and talking and talking and you, you just wanna you know, reach out and say, okay, uh, I wanna ask something, you don't have a choice, you can't do that. Uh, so we thought that internet is gonna be the thing that saves us all. And then we got to open access and open educational resources. It's a good start. The problem is we started building open educational resources in, in um, colleges, in universities, and we kinda kept it there. If you ask common people on the street, do you know that you can find textbooks from college for free, open in your language? They're like, no. And the other thing is like, why would, why would I want to do that? Uh, they don't see the value in them. And then OERs have kind of uh, shifted toward being paid for. So the European Union is famous for giving money. I think that's the only thing that they're famous for. Uh, so giving money, and then people who, who, writing, who write OERs were essentially unpaid until EU started giving money. Now no one wants to write an OER unless they're funded. We kind of shifted the model behind it. Uh, and then MOOCs, Udacity, Open Classroom, MIT coursework. Um, we had Coursera, we, had, we have Udemy still. It's not a win for us, but we have it. Um, so MOOCs. There's a, there's a person that knows a lot of things. They record a video, they post it online, you jump to the portal and you consume it. Does it really work? No. Can you talk with other people? Well, you can use the forum, but that's not really communication. It's more like 17th century, write me a letter, dear John, return it back. So what, what's the point with MOOCs? Why did the MOOCs become so, so popular? Well, Stanford got in, Harvard got in, Oxford got in, and you know, when you hear that, like it's a brand name thing. People want to recognize brands. So MOOCs have, have had the idea from the beginning to replace common academia. Well, what they realized in the process is, I can't really do that because I don't have money. <laughs> How can I fund myself working on this? The model was really proletarian, but not really feasible. So what they did is they shifted to um, basically professional services as teachers. So what they do is they would find a company, you pay them, and then they educate your workers or they educate your staff. They educate people that need to pr produce something for you, which kind of totally digresses to a different model. And by 2017, most of MOOCs were basically freemium. So what you have is if you look at uh, issues with uh, I'm sorry, issues with uh, MOOCs is that 
they have a bad social dynamic, the business model is shifted, but then you have retention, which is a problem. The freemium model works because you as an employer want to pay someone to educate your people. But if you're not paying for something, why would you stay? Why would you have the obligation? Who has that high of like uh, an ethic standard to say, I'm really like, I'm not going to procrastinate. I'm going to sit and learn and, you know, I'm not going to quit. I, I've never, I've never seen that person. But if you know them, just let me know. Um, technology works. It's the internet. So it kind of has to work. It's like a, it's like a CMS if you look at it. It's, it's not that big of a deal. The problem is they haven't really dove into ethics. They haven't really dove into like social dynamic. They, they didn't think about people. They thought about technology. You think about technology and then, you know, these things that we use are really simple to make. We're essentially very primitive race when you look at it. And all of these things can be made. What we don't understand is how we work together and what we do. And how is that like something that organically shifts to a different position? That's like our goal and we want to get there. We don't know how to do that. There's no good management of people right now. So essentially, you know, the audiences have changed. We can't compare ourselves to our predecessors hundreds of years ago because we don't consume, you know, these things, these gadgets have provided us with, with a really nice way to consume, but not enough to participate. The goals have changed. Um, newer generations are more prone to actually acquire a skill than go to college because they know that essentially if they go to college for four years, this four years will be wasted. If they acquire a skill, four years are going to be something that they get themselves ahead of people who are at college. I mean, it's not really true. A lot of colleges provide really good classical foundational knowledge that, that people need. But that's not something that people want. You know, if you, if you ask someone, you know, do you want to learn about data structures? They say no, because they don't see the value in it. But when you start programming and you don't know anything about data structures, you're not a developer. You do WordPress, but that's not development. Uh, so society has changed. I mean, obviously. We've, I, I, I personally think, uh, forgive me if this insults anyone, that we've became more stupid than we were. And then technology obviously has changed. We don't have you know, the steam trains anymore, except in Serbia. Never mind. Um, so we think about these things. Okay, so Marco, you've said a lot of these things. Everything is bad. What do we do? You're proposing a revolution. You want to you know, strip all of these things and just throw away a new one. But we really have everything that we need, except from, for consciousness that this thing, the change of education, needs to be holistic. And then we need to build a holistic model. We already have everything. Look at these buildings. These buildings are not really cheap to build, but we have them. And the model that I have doesn't require buildings. So if we can build the complex like this, we can certainly build something that doesn't require buildings. But it has to be modest. It has to be something that changes our existing means because we already have them. We just, we're just not using them properly. Um, so, this is the education 2.0 part. Um, there are a couple of bold statements coming up. Um, when I say bold, I actually mean it's in bold font. Um, so you know this quote probably, it's, it's a bit changed. Um, so a lot of people say that they're afraid of free education. But if you try to pinpoint who these people are, they're usually representatives of ed tech startups or ed tech companies or government, um, you know, government apparatus that, that has its own way of working. And then they always ask, how is this going to fit into our system? And the only thing that I can say, is it's not going to fit. They have to change. Education like this can grow as a, as a grassroots movement, right? Um, another bold statement. Um, how people f profit from education is fundamentally wrong, and I'm completely against it. Two things that should never be a part of a market, uh, marketplace or any kind of a economy is education and, and you know, health, healthcare. And education like this that we have right now presumes that when you learn something, someone gets paid for it. What I want to say is, 
If you want to have profits, you should be educating people so they can generate that profits for you, not to profit from actually providing the education for them. Um, one of the most important things is none of these things can really work unless you realize this, that the only thing that's setting us back is that we always apply competition to things. Whatever we do, we think, are we better than this thing, or this person, or am I better, or can this school be better than that school? That's why we don't share resources. That's why this education doesn't work, because that there's no intrinsic need for us to connect, to share. We don't build comments. Competition is a problem, and if we want to build a post-scarcity society, we have to start with the foundation, which is education. If you start teaching people that competition is bad, you're going to come to a point where they think, okay, education works. Can we apply this to different things? Maybe we can. Um, so the, idea, the core idea of Education 2.0 is um, be human-centric. Think about the people first. Education now is separated in two categories. The first one is government-mandated education. Go to school, you have to, it's the law. Okay, um, so government has this curriculum. You take it, you, 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 know, you teach kids, and then they go out, and many of them fail in their lives. But it's not your fault, it's their parents' fault. Um, the second education is, we're better than this, we can do free market thing. Let's just educate people and charge them money for it. Who's going to lead that? Industry, because industry is always our benefactor, and people that have the intrinsic motivation to earn money will always have us in mind. They'll think about us. You can see how sarcastic I was. Um, we're basically building new education uh, in a way where you, you let a person whose only motivation is to earn money control something that's so fundamental to us as a society. It's insane. Um, so, the, the last thing that we do is, I don't know how to fix it, I'm, ju I'm just gonna sit and play games. It doesn't work like that, because we don't know how to govern these things. It doesn't mean that we have to lead them like, like this. It, it's wrong. Um, one thing that education has to be, it has to be a public resource. So not public like public universities where there's a guard outside saying, you, I wanna go inside, and they say, you're not, a, you're not a student, but I want to learn. Go back home. It, it doesn't work like that. We don't think about these things like that. Um, there's, this, there, there's a saying that church is always open, where a school needs to be open all the time. A school needs to be open 24-7. And if we change the clock 25-7, it has to be open all the time. And in order to get there, we need to share everything that we have and build it as a common resource shared amongst everyone. So you're kind of getting the point, uh, I think that there should be a one universal school that shares everything and then we just instantiate it to people that need it. So what School 2.0 should do first is be free in both ways in, in English that works. Um, so freedom, you can do whatever you want, whatever you want, unless you endanger someone else. And free, you don't have to pay money for it. People are ready to pay a lot of things, but money is really hard to come by because yeah, it's, it's a fictional resource, but it, it's hard to come by. Uh, people would pay with education. People can actually pay with their own work, which is really good for an idea like this, uh, but they shouldn't be paying money for it because money creates an economy around the school where you need to provide resources and then you kind of have quid pro quo in that, in that sense where it kind of just digresses to being what we have right now. Crowdsourced. All of us should be able to contribute to a singular school. This is so insanely simple. We have Wikipedia, which doesn't do it well, but it does it. Why can't we build a school like this? Think about Wikipedia. Think about all the, the things where you can just come in and just say, I want to add something. Well, in Wikipedia, you can do that, but no one checks it. We'll get to that later. And then if you use technology smart, you can, you can actually adapt and you can personalize uh, the learning experience for everyone that come to a school like that. Uh, meritocracy is kind of something that we know what it is, but we know how to get there. Uh, but mainly what I 
uh, what I want to say with that is if someone wants to contribute, they should be allowed to, whether they have a degree or they don't have, we should just combine our knowledge to see if that input is really valuable or not. If it is, we should allow that. Biomimetic. One thing which is probably foundational to School 2.0 is looking at nature and how we acquire knowledge and then just using technology to augment that process. Because what we do now is we look at nature and say, no, this doesn't work. We'll just put kids into a prison. And it doesn't really work like that. So um, look at how people acquire knowledge. We're, we're basically, if, you, if you're developers, you're, you're going to understand is we're a mesh network. We talk, you know, everyone to everyone. We're connected in some way. We're j just a graph, a, a nice visualization somewhere. And we need to leverage that because right now we're just cutting off people and putting them in, in prisons. It's, it's insane. And when I say universal, that can be a lot of things. One thing is um, it should be obviously not only in English because, you know, there are people talking, speaking other languages. It should be accessible. A lot of people don't have the luxury of good broadband connections, fast computers. That's one of the problems. And the ideal implementation of this would be that we have an open and transparent governance. These are all theoretical things, but um, these are the values that we, we kind of have to you know, abide to. Infrastructure should be open and common. All of these things that we built should be accessible here and in England and in Kenya and to some kid in Shanghai, because it should be a common resource and everybody should have you know, a say in it. Um, and we need to build these things as platforms. We need to build this in a way where someone would come and see a platform and then they would say, okay, I wanna build on top of this. You're providing me APIs and a lot of these things. These are all good things, but then you always have that intrinsic need in our societies to profit off of something. Um, how do we make this possible in School 2.0? Well, if, if you remember I said we don't have to profit from actually uh, providing education, we can profit from providing services and goods. We can actually build a platform that will allow third-party vendors, companies that want to profit to build um, additional support tools or to leverage the platform to actually profit off people who are actually learning while not really profiting off education. And the good thing about this model is that if you look at it uh, like this, where there's the infrastructure, there's the school, and then there's a, like profitable things, something that's commercial, it will slowly go down the stack and everything will become a part of common infrastructure. The challenge is, how do you really govern this thing? I mean, we had, like, you've heard about blockchain. If I say it, not blockchain another time, I don't know, I'll, I'll leave. Um, Sustainability is also hard because, you know, everything costs money. That's like what we've, we've learned to, um, to say. And then we, all, of course, we need to build these things. Technologically, we need to build these things. These things cannot be CMSs. This is not something where you open up a screen and then it just has uh, username, password, login. And like this, this is awesome. Like a lot of sparkly things and then that's it. This shouldn't be a CMS. This should actually be... Um, if you know how public infrastructures work in countries, um, something like Estonia maybe, where they have different services that kind of bind into one ID, that's something that we need to build around this. Licensing is really hard. I'll get to that later. Adoption is going to be stagnant first, and of course, it, it has that, like, it, it's not going to be linear, but it has that first step that we have to make in order to get to this. And then, Extrinsic challenges, what's going to prevent us from actually distributing this? Um, one thing that now we don't understand, that's why we fail at education so, so badly, is the ethics, the motivation. That's something like, we look at technology as like printed circuit boards, you know, shiny aluminum casings, but it's not really that. It's how you apply technology. Technology is something that we've created but yeah, we, we don't control it. We have to control our technology and we have to understand ourselves to control the technology. Um, access to electricity is a, is a really big thing. Uh, access to the internet, of course, uh, goes along. A lot of people in the world don't have electricity. We take it for granted. Um, when there's a cutout, we kind of freak out. 
but a lot of people don't have that. And even if they have, maybe they, they don't have it for the whole day, maybe they have it for two hours, three hours. I know personally a lot of people who've contributed to my project like this, uh, from Africa, from Sudan, who had to go to a university library to actually get access to internet. So we have to think about this um, when we actually build the implementation. And you know, personal computing units, uh, Raspberry Pis and a lot of these things are kind of cheap, but not really useful. We have to, we have to think about that. And then there's, there's digital literacy. Um, you know, a lot of people don't really know how to um, use the computer, how to type in a document, how to access the internet. That's something that we need to work on. These are all prerequisites for, for the school 2.0 to happen. And then if you look at the base model, right now what we have is we have the principles. And these are the things that we see as values. These are like this ideology kind of stuff that you just you know, write down and you hope to you know, disseminate to people and say this is awesome and, and follow this. That's the values that we have. Then there's the governance part. How are we going to control the whole thing that happens afterward? And then there's the standards. Imagine, you know, this is a document that describes how you need to do this, 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 and this. Committees are something that we have to build in order for a school like this to be applicable to anywhere. So if you want to actually access people, which are on, on, on the other part of the stack, you have to have people in Sofia who are actually going to work with them, engage people, talk to people, build a tiny implementation of a school. And then we have, of course, the infrastructure part, the part that we don't have free right now, that we need to free, liberate from, from what we have, and that's software, corpses of knowledge, and data. Software, uh, you can think about that as, uh, as an um, academic journal, an actual virtual learning environment, and any kind of software that helps you learn. Corpuses of knowledge, you can think about that as Wikipedia. Uh, a whole bunch of knowledge on some topic, in one place, you just keep it there, everybody can access. It's insane that we have the internet for 40 years and we don't have a corpus like that. Wikipedia is not really that, Wikipedia is a bit different. And then you have data. Open data is a big thing right now, it's, it's becoming uh, more prominent. Uh, but data about our behavior, data about what we do, data about how we learn, that's something that we need to open up in order to understand how to actually do that. So, uh, until now, I was basically talking about the theory about how this thing should work. Two years ago, I've actually started implementing this thing. Even though it's like two years old, I still consider it an infant. Um, and that's my project at Zamfir. So Zamfir should be, and it is, an archetype of School 2.0. What I wanted to do is basically I wanted to take that model, build on top of it, and try to build a practical school for people to learn CS, programming, um, design, a lot of these things in digital skills that they need. Um, so by subsetting the scope of knowledge that I wanted to present, I actually you know, kind of shrunk the whole need to think about a lot of things. And I was actually able to start implementing something that, that's re really there. So the goal was get people to contribute to CS knowledge. Like think about Java, JavaScript, PHP, whatever programming language, data structures anything that you need to be a developer or designer, we want to build a corpus of that that anyone can access. And it's, it's easier to do that in CS than in medicine because in medicine you, you obviously, you know, it's a bit more delicate. Uh, but in CS a lot of these resources are, are already online but it's scattered around the whole internet. So what we need to do is we need to build a format and something that is going to keep that data in. Free software is the core uh, is a foundational thing in, in, in School 2.0 because we want to build an open source academic journal. We want to build an open source uh, corpus viewer, a virtual learning environment, a personal learning bot. We want to build these things as open source components that anyone can use, anyone can localize, anyone can learn with them. Um, then we want to explore, like, when you, when you start practically applying these things, then you, you kind of understand what real requirements are. The things that I mentioned previously are basically a product of investigation of, of requirements in, in the past two years. Um, and then, of course, testing premises on sustainability. That's where we come to the, to the model that, that we have. Um, one thing that's really important is what do we want to build? This is a project. 
think about this as a public startup. So we want to build a virtual learning environment where you can just log in and learn, but we want to build an offline learning environment. If anyone knows about Node School or how Khan Academy works in, uh, in a sense that they, you know, schools use their content to provide offline education because not a lot of people have access to the internet, we want to build that. We want to build an identity stack. We want to build something where you have one account, think about it as Google but not as evil, and then, and then you can use that to access all of the services that are built on top of Zamfir. Um, we want to provide open data. Actually, we want to seed open data because we, we just want to provide a good starting point for people who want to contribute. And then, of course, the API because you want to, you want to have people build on top of that. Um, the, the, the idea is to actually enable any kind of uh, a medium for presenting knowledge. What that means is you can actually use Zonfit to present like this. But then you can do peer-to-peer -peer learning, you know, sit in a bar, drink a beer or, or a juice or whatever, and just talk about things. You can actually use the same model for any kind of instrumentation of, of lectures. And it needs to be social. So even online, we're looking at how to apply good algorithms to access people and to move them and to make them go out and, uh, you know, kind of share with other people. And of course, we want to do that by providing them with projects. So no knowledge comes you know, without applying it, so we want to have people build something. And the idea of the Zonfit is that while teaching people how to do CS and how to program and how to design, they would be able to help us build School 2.0 back. That's the thing that I've mentioned previously. They don't have to pay. They have, you know, the, the idea is allowing them to give back if they want to, but not charging them with money. So, this is how a school model would work. The base model was just this, but then we added a learning environment. As I said, that can be a gas station, a classroom, a bus, whatever. Then you have the software that's powering these learning environments. And on top of that, you have identity, you have data, and then you have APIs. And the most important thing about this is that I firmly believe, but it's not really a time uh, right now, that identity will shift to the infrastructure part because we'll be able to provide decentralized, uncontrolled identity. So, you know, the, the school wouldn't control your identity. You would have a, a singular identity throughout the whole stack. So this, this fund, it doesn't really give you an insight of what can you do really better than MOOCs. So one thing is, I've, I've come with, um, with a few imagines. So imagine algo-generated paths. Imagine if you can give data to computers and ask them, there are a thousand people who've graduated from this course. What are the you know, points that they need to make to be efficient, to be dynamic, and how, what's the best path for them to learn something? And then a computer will basically give you back the points in corpus, which, you know, it's data powered, which are basically the shortest way for someone and the best way for someone to acquire knowledge. So you get like, you, you compile a path from all of these combining factors. That's something that we can't do now because all of the things that we kind of do digitally are not really digital, they're just additional to what we do offline. Another imagine is smart document. So right now, if you want to type code somewhere uh, online, you would have to have a server that knows how to compile your language, and then you send your code to it, and then it compiles your language, and it turns it back. So you, you can't really compile code in documents, except in Jupyter. But what we had in mind is we actually started working on this, build on top of ODF, put a virtual machine inside that runs JavaScript and WebAssembly, and then through WebAssembly, add kernels that can run Rust, PHP, Java, whatever. So you would essentially get a document that has a virtual machine inside that can run code. Now imagine if everyone can contribute to it, and then you can compile the code inside, get visualizations inside, get actual like live documents that, that update as you, as you type in code. That's something that's like an autonomous computer. You got a document, but it's, it's a computer inside. That's something that we don't have right now. And then there's, of course, more things. Algo-generated content, something that we started working on. Um, essentially, let um, a learning neural network uh, go through the internet, scrape for something, uh, a topic or something, and then just 
um, they try to do content summation. Uh, what we try to achieve is let a bot scrape the internet and they come back with a tutorial on a topic. It's pretty far away, but it's, it's, uh, it's feasible. It's something that we've tested out and it seems that it, it's kind of doing, doing well for, for now. We would ideally have robots that constantly update the corpus. So people in the future wouldn't have to add to that corpus that we built. Uh, we wouldn't have to crowdsource the bots would kind of just scrape the internet and add new things. Um, so one of the things is, of course, bots, 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 always bots, um, Facebook bots, Viber bots, WhatsApp bots, whatever you want to do, that remind you to, to learn, remind you that you have obligations, that remind you to, you know, project is due or your code analysis is finished or something like that. Augmented social engines, something that, um, that you can log into and then they can help you connect to people that are actually complementary to your skills. So if you want to build a team, the AI can actually find best people for you and for your, uh, for your project, comparing your skills and your dynamics and whatnot. Impact analysis is, you can actually see, right now we have that built, is how many people you've impacted just by contributing to the corpus. And you can see that not just locally, but globally. And of course, there are multiple other things. Evaluation is really hard. Uh, digital didactics, echo, and things like that, like small bots that can actually talk to you and then you don't have to read. I mean, it's, it's like pure laziness, but it, it can be done. And then another thing is I've mentioned commercial. So what can uh, companies build on top of Zomfix platform is that they can do recruitment, they can do mentoring, they can do didactics, again, bots, 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 and analysis tools. So all of these things are really important to companies because they don't really have access to um, to behavioral data for candidates. They don't really know who they hire. CVs are basically blatant lies printed on a piece of paper. So, you know, you, you kind of have to know what people are, have been doing or uh, how to approach them. All of these things can be built on the API that Zamper provides. And now this is the final federation model. So the federation would essentially be things outside Zamfir, goods and services, which third parties would be able to, uh, to build on top of Zamfir. And this is something that, like a complete implementation of a school 2.0 would be in real life. You would have people who would con congregate to, uh, to corpuses, and then when they congregate and add to, to these corpuses, they can be applied to learning environments, either offline or, or online. And then you'd have uh, you know, the APIs that allows companies to access all these things on the stack. So all of these things, if you look at it, technology, 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 and then there's a shift, technology to people, 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 and values. And that's where we have the complete stack from technology to ethics, to values, to all of these things that make us human, to all of these things that make us technologically advanced, if you can say that in today's world. Uh, but essentially, this is the whole model of a school. So uh, quickly to wrap it up, uh, we've actually built the, pro uh, the identity service uh, the virtual learning environments and offlines are something that's being tested right now. Community Hub is also in progress. And uh, of course, I, I want to invite everyone to join, ask me any questions that you have. But you know, we, we could uh, use help with knowledge exchange, any kind. If you're a developer, of course, you're welcome, designers too. But we also need people who are in communication, in PR, in legal. Uh, we've, we've seen that a lot of people who want to liberate knowledge have been unfairly treated by different structures because they didn't have legal expertise. Uh, and of course, we, we, you know, we encourage people to advocate this idea and um, talk to government representatives, industry representatives about this because that's something that we need to, um, to provide to governments and municipalities and whatnot. They want a finished uh, solution. They don't want to think about it. So if we can advocate for this, we can actually build a school that's global, uh, that anyone can access in a, in a village, in a city, you know, with internet, without internet, and we can get an actual free universal education for the bottom seven billion, but of course, if the rest want to join, why not? And that's it for me, thank you very much. We have uh, a little time for some questions from the audience. Is there any volunteer? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so first, uh, I'd like to uh, encourage you to keep working on this direction. It's like 
something that's really in big, big troubles worldwide, not just here, but we see it here. So, uh, thank you. I just comment more and uh, on the part where you mentioned the issues of the education 1.0. I'd have to agree and disagree at the same time with that. Uh, I'll start from like our parents, grandparents, and all of them. They didn't have technology, they didn't have nothing that we have now, but they were like more, way more successful than we are, like in learning and everything. And they used to learn in the same way, like schools, books, teachers, and whatever, and it was even harder for them than us. Like, their teachers were rougher and, right? Uh, so, I agree that uh, for most of students, like schools and having the windows that cannot get out and doors and everything, is like, like a prison, but uh, I'd say that that's a good start and we should keep, keep it that way, just because I don't know about you, but I'm a parent and I wouldn't take the risk on letting my kid get out and learn from the uh, <laughs> wild world, let's say. So, yeah, uh, what I would agree is that uh, it has changed the way that, uh, so the kids, it's true, they miss uh, motivation and all that. And I wouldn't say it's the school or is the walls or everything, it, I'd say it's more like the teachers and mentors. We know here how they get hired, how they get the jobs, so I'd say it's a better mm, workaround and a good direction to work on, uh, just like uh, providing a solution on uh, selecting who becomes a teacher in the beginning from the small kids, like the starters because that's where they like get their real path right yeah. if they start like uh, they get motivation to start learning uh, get uh, methods of teaching and studying and such things yeah so when I think about so the, the idea of Zanfir is actually tailored to more 16 and above because children are you know the most precious thing that we have and there's a lot of things that um, we need to take care uh, before we start applying these to kids. So putting kids in a sandbox is, is really uh, a mitigation of possible problems that we might encounter, so we do it because it's safe. Uh, but one thing that, that is really important because uh, um, older people, our, our predecessors were, um, scarcity of resources implies that you have to work more to get to, to them. And because they didn't have resources, they've, they've been more, um, you know, they've been adamant about learning. When you, when you think about people from 200 years ago, they've been so proud about learning that it was, it was really a matter of personal pride how much you can learn and how much you can expand your knowledge. Right now, we have access to everything, and, uh, you know, that's, that, that's, that's why we, we kind of, you know, dig, digress to, to a period behind, you know, w w what they did. Basically, we're getting worse because we have more. Definitely, that's my comment. So. I again encourage you to continue on this and Thanks. encourage others to join you. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, so we, sorry, we have no more time for official questions, but uh, you can talk to Marco when you go outside. So let us thank him again. <laughs>